Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning, North Google. I'm Rachel Cataldo. And I'm Sadie Chakotis. story of the week, and probably the year so far, is the inauguration of Donald Trump. At 12 o'clock this afternoon, Trump will take the oath of office and will be sworn in as the 45th President of the United States. Over the course of the past year, countless stories have run about Donald Trump, so the American public knows quite a lot about our newest Commander-in-Chief. One of the areas that is getting a lot of recent publicity are his selections for the Cabinet positions. The cabinet includes the vice president and the heads of 15 executive departments. Each of the positions carry a variety of responsibilities regarding the allocation of federal funding and direction of legislation in their respective areas. Because of the importance of each department's decisions, a great deal of news coverage has been given to certain selections. Some of the publicity has been directed at the connections to big businesses, conflicts of interest, and lack of qualifications. But we will let you be the judge. Here are a few new additions to the White House staff. Americans welcome this rededication to American security, liberty, and prosperity. But new leadership is incomplete without accountability. If accountability does not start with ourselves, we cannot credibly extend it to our friends and our adversaries. We must hold ourselves accountable to upholding the promises we make to others. An America that can be trusted in good faith is essential to supporting our partners, achieving our goals, and assuring our security. We must hold our allies accountable to commitments they make. We cannot look the other way at allies who do not meet their obligations. This is an injustice not only to us, but to longstanding friends who honor their promises and bolster our own national security, such as Israel. And we must hold those who are not our friends accountable to the agreements they make. Our failure to do this over the recent decades has diminished our standing and encouraged bad actors around the world to break their word. We cannot afford to ignore violations of international accords as we have done with Iran. We cannot continue to accept empty promises like the ones China has made to pressure North Korea to reform, only to shy away from enforcement. Looking the other way when trust is broken only encourages more bad behavior, and it must end. Is Vladimir Putin a war criminal? I would not use that term. Well, let me describe the situation in Aleppo, and perhaps that will help you reach that conclusion. Uh, in Aleppo, Mr. Putin has directed his military to conduct a devastating campaign. He's targeted schools, markets, not just assisted the Syrians in doing it. His military has targeted schools and markets and other civilian infrastructure. It's resulted in the death of thousands of civilians. He used battlefield weapons against civilians, and when it was all said and done, an estimated 300,000 civilians were killed, and the city was completely destroyed. So, based on all this information, and what's publicly in the record about what's happened in Aleppo and the Russian military, you are still not prepared to say that Vladimir Putin and his military have violated the rules of war and have conducted war crimes in Aleppo. Now, those are very, very serious uh, charges to make, and I would want to have much more information before reaching a conclusion. I understand there is a body of record in the public domain. I'm sure there's a body of record in the classified domain. And I think in order, in order to deal with a serious question like this, Mr. Tillerson, the, what's happened uh, in Aleppo is be, in the public I would domain. Want to be the videos public, and the pictures are there. Fully informed before advising the president. We see each day a world awash in change. Our country is still at war in Afghanistan and our troops are fighting against ISIS and other terrorist groups in the Middle East and elsewhere. Russia is raising grave concerns on several fronts, and China is shredding trust along its periphery. Increasingly, we see islands of stability in our hemisphere, democracies here in Europe and in Asia under attack by non-state actors and nations that mistakenly see their security 
and the insecurity of others. If you confirm me, my watchwords will be solvency and security in providing for the protection of our people and the survival of our freedoms. My priorities as Secretary of Defense will be to strengthen military readiness, strengthen our alliances, and bring business reforms to the Department of Defense. Our military is the envy of the world, representing America's awesome determination to defend herself. Working with you, I will endeavor to keep our unique all-volunteer force second to none. We open the door to all patriots who are eligible and meet the standards, provide them with the training, equipment, and leadership essential to their success, and ensure all service members are treated with dignity and respect. Uh, I'm coming in with the understanding that I lead the Department of Defense, and if someone brings me a problem, then I'll look at it, but I'm not coming in looking for problems. I'm looking for ways to get the department so it's at the most lethal uh, stance. And in that regard, it's all about military readiness. Senator, my, con my concern is on the readiness of the force to fight and to make certain that it's at the top of its game so when we go up against an enemy, the criteria for everything we do in the military up until that point when we put our young men and women across the line of departure is they will be at their most lethal stance. That's my obligation as I uh, move into this job. I think we can all agree that learning as a lifelong pursuit is a fundamental American virtue. We are blessed beyond measure with educators who pour themselves into students. The schools in which they work are as diverse as the students they educate. In fact, all of us here and our children have attended a mix of traditional, publicly funded, and private schools. This is a reflection of the diversity that is today's public education. I share President-elect Trump's view that it's time to shift the debate from what the system thinks is best for kids to what moms and dads want, expect, and deserve. Parents no longer believe that a one-size-fits-all model of learning meets the needs of, need of every child, and they know other options exist, whether magnet, virtual, charter, home, faith-based, or any other combination. Yet too many parents are denied access to the full range of options, choices that many of us here in this room have exercised for our own children. Why in 2017 are we still questioning parents' ability to ex exercise educational choice for their children? I'm a firm believer that parents should be empowered to choose the learning environment that's best for each of their individual children. And this is, uh, brings me to the issue of, of proficiency, which uh, the senator uh, uh, cited, versus growth. And I would like your, your views on uh, the relative advantage of measuring, uh, doing assessments and using them to measure proficiency or to me measure growth. Well, thank you, Senator, for that question. Um, I think if, if I'm understanding your question correctly around proficiency, I would, I would also um, correlate it to competency and mastery so that you, each student is measured according to the um, advancement that they're making in each subject area. Well, that's growth. A, at, at, that's not proficiency. Well, this, well, is, this is a subject that is, has been debated in the education community for years. Indeed. And I've, I've advocated growth as the chairman and every member of this committee knows because with proficiency, uh, teachers uh, ignore the kids at the top mm -hmm. who are not going to fall below proficiency and they ignore the kid at the bottom who no matter what they do will never get to proficiency. So I've been an advocate of growth. But it surprises me that you don't know this issue. We would like to remind everyone that cell phone use is strictly limited to the cafeteria and in classrooms where teachers have permitted use for class activities. Students are not allowed to use cell phones in the hallways or at lockers at any time. Any students caught using cell phones in the halls can be punished for cell phone violations. It has been 10 weeks since our last word splat quiz and it's time to see how much you remember about the second set of words. If you have not already begun the quiz, please use the beginning of the silent sustained reading time to complete the assignment. I'm Rachel Cataldo. And I'm Sadie Chakotis. Have a great weekend, Spartans.